Good evening. Good evening. How's everyone? Oh, good. Good. That was pretty good. <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy Kwanzaa to everyone. I hope you had a good one. Uh, my name is Kevin Young, and it is my honor to serve as the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'm so glad to have you here tonight. This is our first Historically Speaking program of 2024. This program series responds to significant events affecting the African American community. And it's an opportunity to highlight journalists, cultural critics, and writers who I think you'll agree we need now more than ever. Before I talk with you about our panelists and author, I want to leave you with three numbers. The first is 100. <clears throat> and I say 100 because ever since 1915, when veterans of the Civil War petitioned to have a monument on the Mall to their services and sacrifice to the nation over 100 years ago now, but almost 100 years to the year when the museum was opened. That was the first iteration of the monument that this museum became. I also think about 100 because my grandmother turned 100 last May. Um, <laughs> we have to applaud that. And I think so much about the generation she raised, the history she saw survived and passed down. There were five generations of us celebrating her in May, uh, dancing and, and singing along to Stevie Wonder. So uh, it's wonderful to think about that 100 years, and that 100 years, of course, marked by uh, these veterans of the Civil War who fought for the sacrifice and struggle to be recognized in a place like this. I also want to use uh, the, the number, a much bigger number, 10 million. Because 10 million is the number of people who have been to this museum since we opened in 2016. Isn't that incredible? And what I love about that number is that the 10 millionth visitor was here uh, to just in our cafe to celebrate and commemorate and commiserate with friends over her book group. So this is a place of pilgrimage, of fellowship, of art and artifacts, history and culture, and people really take it as their own, which I hope you do too. The last number I want to leave us with is 60. Now 60 uh, is because we've just passed last year the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which we commemorated here in the museum in many ways, but not least of which it's commemorated by the I Have a Dream speech which I hope you know, and I hope you can come back to see another time. Uh, we have a copy of that Villanova has so graciously loaned to us long term. And we put it on display for moments like this, uh, approaching the King holiday, and his birthday, of course, uh, coming up next week. But what's powerful about that is it's not just the I have a dream speech, but it's the very podium copy, the copy that he read from on the podium. And as you probably know, one of the most powerful things about that speech is it doesn't have the words, I have a dream on it anywhere. Those were all improvised by King. And I just had the pleasure of, uh, I just got the book just now, but I, I went immediately to Jonathan Eig's chapter about that speech. And his rendering of it is so powerful, I hope he gets to talk about that tonight. Because thinking about that improvisation, the way that King brought everything to bear, the civil rights movement, the preacher tradition, that tradition of the church that many of us grew up in, uh, where he's talking not just about the current moment, but about the past, about prophecy, the very things that are held in this museum is so powerful. So I hope you get a chance to uh, read and, and enjoy the book as I have. Um, tonight's panel discussion, as you know, features journalist Michelle Martin and author Jonathan Eig in conversation about this recent book, King, A Life. I'll remind you that this is the first major biography in decades about King, and it gives us an MLK for our times, a deep thinker, a brilliant strategist, and a committed radical who led one of the country's and history's greatest movements. In one week, as I said, we'll be celebrating MLK's 95th birthday, and his demands for racial and economic justice remain as urgent today as they were in his lifetime. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and please enjoy the program. Thanks. I just want to thank um, Kevin for such a wonderful start to the program this evening. 
My name is Deirdre Cross, and I'm the Assistant Director for Public Programs here at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And I'm so pleased that uh, so many of you joined us tonight in person and, in, and digitally from wherever you are. I'd like a, to take a moment, though, to offer brief introductions of tonight's speakers, starting with Mr. Jonathan Ike. He's the author of six books focused on historic figures or events, including Al Ali, A Life, describing the stellar career and life and achievements of Muhammad Ali, which won a 2018 PEN America Literary Award, which Esquire magazine has named one of the 25 greatest biographies of all time. Another of his works entitled The Birth of the Pill will be staged soon as a theatrical production by Time Life Theater in Chicago. John, Jonathan joins us tonight to talk about his most recent work, King, Alive, which the New York Times hailed as the definitive biography of Martin Luther King Jr. King Alive has been nominated for a National Book Award. Tonight's conversation also features journalist Michelle Martin, host of NPR's Morning Edition, and the previous host of Weekend All Things Considered. During her 25-year career, Michelle has received numerous honors, including the Candace Award for Communications from the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, an Emmy Award, and election into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences for Outstanding Achievement in Journalism. As you're listening to our speakers tonight, we welcome you to jot down questions that you might have and we'll collect them throughout the evening. And those of you that are joining us digitally, do please do the same and we'll collect them and make sure Michelle poses them uh, during her conversation. But for now, please join me in a warm welcome for Michelle Martin and Jonathan Eig. Good evening. And those of you who have pretended to your family that you're football fans, your secret is safe with us. <laughs> we're glad to see you. And we're very glad to have you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, as Ms. Cross said, uh, this is all of our evening. So if you have questions, comments, thoughts, we'd love to hear them. And we will take as many as we can, as soon as we can. So as soon as you have a thought that you want to share or a question, Please feel free to make it known, and we'll get to as many as we can. And we might get you out in time for halftime. <laughs> Jonathan, I get such a pleasure to 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 see you, to visit with you, to see you in person. Aren't we glad about that? I mean, thank you. Especially flying in from from Chicago, at, which is in the middle of in January, you truly are committed. <laughs> it's warmer here, so I'm happy to That's be here true. for that reason too. But the first question I had is. You know, your work has been so eclectic. I mean, you've written about, of course, Muhammad Ali, and, and I think many of you who've seen um, Ken Burns' documentary about Muhammad Ali, you'll have seen, you, you know, quoted extensively in it as an expert on him, but you've also written about, um, gosh, here we go. They were, so, they were so different that I couldn't keep them all in my head. You've written about the birth of the pill, how four crusaders reinvented sex and launched a revolution. You wrote about uh, the, the, uh, the effort to capture Al Capone. Uh, of course, you wrote about Jackie Robinson, and you wrote about Lou Gehrig. So why, why this book, and why now? Well, Muhammad Ali led me to Martin Luther King. In fact, it was here in Washington, D.C., where I was interviewing Dick Gregory over breakfast at a hotel. And I was asking, I was working on my Ali book at the time, and I was trying to find out what Ali and King thought of each other, how they got along, because they were so very different. And of course, Ali was really opposed to the mainstream civil rights movement and to the integration efforts. And when I was talking to Dick Gregory, he said to me, first of all, that Ali and King got along great, that they loved each other. They both had fabulous sense of humor. And you don't think of King really being very funny because when he was in public, he was always very careful to convey this very serious image. The only time I've ever actually seen TV footage of King laughing is when he was with Muhammad Ali. They did a press conference together in Louisville. 
And first of all, Ali keeps interrupting King. Like, who interrupts Martin Luther King, right? <laughs> Only Ali. And then um, he keeps cracking him up, and, and King can't control himself. He just, he's cracking up. But it was Dick Gregory who got me, gave me, got me thinking about doing this book because he said to me, do you know the difference between Martin Luther King and Jesus? Mm. And because it's Dick Gregory, I assumed, it, well, I thought it might be a joke, a riddle of some kind, so I didn't say a word. <laughs> and he said, the difference is that we have videotape of Martin Luther King. And I'm still mm. twisting that around in my head. But the other thing that occurred to me when he said that is we have more than videotape. We have his friends still alive. We have people who knew him well. As um, Kevin pointed out, um, he would be 95 if he were st uh, uh, next week. Um, his older sister just passed away last year. There are still hundreds of people who knew him. So in that moment when I was talking to Dick Gregory, that's when it occurred to me that my time would be really well spent if I did nothing but travel the country for the next five or six years interviewing friends and colleagues and family members of King. And that's where the idea began. And, and it just so happened that there had not been a biography of King since 1982. And that was just mind boggling to me because I think we need a new biography of King every, at least every generation. Well, it is. A, it, I mean, I can also see where it's a daunting task because there have been some fine biographies of Dr. King, there have been some fine documentaries, uh, you know, um, fictional treatments that have done very well, that have also been revealing plays and so forth. And I'm just wondering, was there any aspect of that that was intimidating to you? All of it was intimidating. Um, when I look back on it, I still think, wow, that was a really uh, potentially dumb idea. But the thing about it was that I felt like talking to these people, I began to realize that we really lacked an intimate portrait mm. of King. That the Taylor Branch books, the David Garrow books, a lot of these documentaries, and certainly the effect of the national holiday and the monument has been to water down his image, to take away his, his true radical nature, to simplify his message in a way that's more palatable to mainstream audiences, in particular to white audiences, to talk about I have a dream, to talk about content of our character, and to forget that the first half of the I have a dream speech, the part that we have here at the museum, talks about reparations and police brutality. So we've, we've chosen the convenient king, and we've forgotten that he was a person, that he had flaws, that he had feelings, that he had failed at times. So I thought it would be just an amazing opportunity to try to write a book that gave him some of that humanity back and allowed people to connect with him in a more emotional way. And also, you had the benefit of the fact that the FBI surveillance tapes have finally been made public. Fascinating. Uh, and your book comes out, I'm sure, I don't know if you've read Beverly Gage's biography of J. Edgar Hoover, fascinating, where she also benefited from the release of these tapes. Did you know that was going to happen as you were reporting the book, or did that was that one of those you know, happy accident? wasn't an accident, but it was one of those happy circumstances that, that you didn't really discover until you got into it. No, I knew. First of all, there had been thousands of pages released many years ago, and some of them were even in the books that were published by David Garrow and Taylor Branch, but more have been trickling out, and Donald Trump actually accidentally released thousands and thousands of pages more of the, of the King transcripts, and that's my favorite act of the Trump administration. Um, <laughs> Okay, I shouldn't have said that. But um, the, the, the FBI tapes are both, it, it's, it's ironic because they have the effect of, they were, they were, the surveillance was conducted to try to destroy him. Excuse me, let me just stop. Do you all know about this? Have you all heard about that? Okay, I'm just checking, just A check. Quick summary, the FBI began wiretapping King's associates and then began wiretapping King's home and office. First because they thought he might have ties to communists, which became clear he did not. And then very quickly they heard him on the phone with women other than his wife and they became obsessed with that because they thought they could use that to destroy him. Literally use that to try to, con to push him to commit suicide. Leaked it to members of the media, leaked it to members of Congress, trying to undermine his work, undermine his reputation, which they did very effectively. I think part of the reason King gets such bad press coverage the last four or five years of his life is because everybody in the media knows about his personal life, about his sex life, and that has an impact on the way he's covered and the way he's perceived by Americans. So the FBI is, is accomplishing much of what it seeks in its surveillance of King. For me, the irony, so I have two important goals in my book. One is to expose the FBI and to show just how malicious and how racist they were. But the irony is that it helps us to better understand 
and to sympathize with King because we can read the transcripts of his private conversations and we can see how he's suffering, how full of doubt he is at times, how even his best friends and closest advisors are failing to understand his ideals. They're encouraging him to be more practical, be more pragmatic. Stop speaking out on northern racism. It's hurting the cause. Stop speaking out on the Vietnam War. It's driving a wedge between you and the president. And King has to explain, and we can read the transcripts of these conversations. It breaks my heart. We can read the conversations with his closest friends where he says, don't you know me? Don't you understand that I don't care about doing the right thing politically? I'm trying to do the right thing morally. And we can read that because of the FBI's surveillance. So in addition to like, like what Brother Dick Gregory was saying, in addition to the fact that we have tapes, we also have the transcripts, which, I mean, it sounds, it sounds biblical, doesn't it? That even in his own time, the people closest to him were doubting, doubting him. It's, a, it's so fascinating. There's so many things about this book that are so fascinating that you even, if you, even if you think you kind of really know the story, there's just so much there that um, is new and resonant. Did you approach this with the idea that some folks got it wrong? I mean, did you see this book as additive or corrective? Both, I guess. Um, there were definitely some things that needed to be corrected. I think in general, I wanted to correct the sense that we have, the big picture, I wanted to correct the sense we have that he was the more conservative black leader. You know, and I've been touring the country for the last six, eight months, talking to college kids a lot, and they're shocked to hear me say and to argue that Martin Luther King was more radical than Malcolm X. I think it's a great subject for debate, and we had a fabulous debate about it at Morehouse, and I think you can legitimately make the argument. So one of the things I wanted to accomplish and correct was this sense that he was this safe, conservative guy who's negotiating with, with, with white power structure to get what he wants. No, he's fighting to fundamentally change the status quo and to change the balance of power, and he's more effective than anyone else, I think. So I wanted to correct that image for sure. And there were some specific things that I wanted to correct, too. I wanted to, as I said, you know, remind people that he was flawed, that he chewed his fingernails, that he smoked cigarettes, that he, um, that he had doubts, that he failed over and over again. Because the greatest thing about King, to me, is that he was willing to fail over and over again and to keep trying. So, you know, Montgomery is this enormous success that launches his career and his fame. And then what happens? St. Augustine fails. Albany, Georgia fails. And then he goes to Birmingham, and it's failing too, until finally Bull Connor kind of turns things around and, and it succeeds. But King's, and his willingness to go to Chicago, which is perceived by many as a failure, it's his willingness to not just to assume personal physical risk, but to risk his reputation, to risk failure over and over again, to shine the light on racism, even if it means that he's not going to come out of it well. That's the thing that... I think we, we lose sight of, because we think about Birmingham and Selma and March on Washington as these great victories. But he failed way more than he succeeded. All right, I'm, I'm gonna carry more stories you know, from the book, more stories from your reporting, but I'm just kind of setting the table here with a little bit of your method, because I don't know if, because presumably you're gonna read the book after this, and I just want you to have some of this in your mind while you're reading it. Did you, all right, I'm just gonna say it, I'm just gonna say it, I'm just gonna go right there. White people, have always written about King, but and you've always written about black people. <laughs> but was there any part of you that hesitated as a as a white person in taking this on? No, absolutely. First of all, attempting any biography is an act of hubris, right? Who am I to tell Lou Gehrig's story? I didn't know him. I didn't. He didn't ask me for permission to. to he didn't ask me to write his biography. Um, but when you're taking on the story of someone like King, it's even greater the responsibility and the, the fear, really. So I would not have undertaken it without a lot of apprehension and without a lot of, with a very, what I think is a very cautious approach. And the first thing I did was I called people like Dick Gregory and Andrew Young and Jesse Jackson and Reverend James La um, Lawson and Bernard Lafayette, and I said, do you think we need a new King biography? And if I decided to undertake this, would you help me? And when they all said yes, then I approached a lot of the leading scholars, uh, like Peniel Joseph and Lerone Martin, and asked them, do you think we need a new King biography? And if I decided to take it on, would you help me? And 
unanimously, I got this response that we desperately needed a new hmm. King biography. Any, so anybody say no? We don't. We don't. We don't. Diane Nash. Really? The only one who said no to me. She said no. She wouldn't talk to you, or she said no. We don't need a new biography, both. or both. Both. Wow. Yeah. Well, she talks she, to me. <laughs> I should have told her I was your friend. Right. I haven't written a biography though. Maybe. No, her argument was a good one. She what said, "We're too focused on King." That is interesting. The, the story of the civil rights movement is too heavily reliant on King, and that we lose sight of all the people who were working the grassroots. Well, we Diane lose sight Ash, of the for women. Those, you all know who she is. I mean, you don't have to know. It's okay. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. One of the great strategists of the movement, as a very young woman, um, and I one of the, the great, to her arc, one of the great, stra along with Bayard Rustin, of course, yeah. of the March on Washington. One of the, you know, she's the only one who said no, and I uh, respect her for it because her argument is, is a solid one. And I made the argument that by that King is going to get people in the door, you know, and that King is going to allow me to give Coretta Scott King the first really complex portrait that she's ever been given. And I believe that my book is the, I don't want to brag, I think it's the best portrait of Coretta Scott King that we've ever been able to produce. Okay, well, let's do it. Let's, how did they meet? Let's start with, let's, how did they meet? They met in Boston. King was, in, uh, was at Boston University getting his doctorate. She was at New England Conservatory of Music studying to become a concert singer. And King was dating, I don't know, five or six women at the time, which was his usual, about his average. And You're not he, kidding. You're no, not I'm not kidding. <laughs> one of my favorite interviews was June Dobbs Butts, who was King's, yes. one of King's closest friends from age 12. Her sister dated King. Her best friend was engaged to King. And it was June who said to me, ML, as she called him, was never monogamous a day in his life. And June went on to become a sex therapist at Masters and Johnson. <laughs> I don't know if King had any effect on that career choice, but she was, oh, I love that woman. And um, King fell in love with Coretta because, and told her on the first date, you're exactly what I've been looking for. Because she was more of an activist than any girl he'd ever met. And he, she was actually more of an activist, more experienced than he was at that point. She'd gone to Antioch. She'd been involved in all of these student protests. She'd been to the Progressive Party National Convention. King hadn't done anything yet. He had ambitions. He was one of his lines that he used to like to work, use on women, jive, as Coretta called it, was, I'm going to go back down south and kill Jim Crow. And, uh, but Coretta said, how? You know, she's the one who challenged him. And she always challenged him throughout their lives together, even though his backwards views about w gender um, and women's roles kept her at home. One of, the, one of my, there's so many anecdotes in the book that just both cracked me up and infuriated me, but one of them was where he kind of suggested to her that, she, well, she wasn't interested in makeup and all of this and get, I mean, she, you know, which was fascinating to me because whenever, you know, the public image or whenever you saw her in public, she was impeccable. Whether she was marching in Selma, whether she was out there, I mean, literally, you know, literally weeks after he was killed, she was leading a march. But she was always impeccable. And how, when they met, she really didn't care about all that. And he would suggest when they'd go out on a date, she goes, he would say, you can, you can say, brother, do you want to uh, go in and uh, fix yourself up a little bit? Yeah, <laughs> do you want to refresh it Do you want to go, go in the ladies' room and put on a little more lipstick? Like, she was like, no. <laughs> so what did she see in him? Mm -hmm. He was so charming mm -hmm. and so bright. And everyone loved him. You know, he just, he was just, so charismatic, and, and this is the other thing we forget about him because we, we only focus on his leadership roles. We forget that he was just a delight to be around. And this is one of my favorite parts of this journey, these six and a half years I spent on this book, is just asking people, like, what was it like to be in the room with him? That's a question that Robert Caro talks about a lot. He always asks, what was it like to be in the room? And you just ask it over and over again so that it becomes awkward after a while. What do you mean, what's it like to be in the room? You just keep asking the same question. What was it like to be in the room? And people would say, I remember I asked Harry Belafonte that question. I said, what was it like to be in the room when you guys were bored, when you had nothing else to do? And Belafonte just stopped and he said, nobody's ever asked me that before. I'm going to think about it. And I love that because he's actually going to think about it. When you get these people who've been interviewed a million times, and you know this as a great interviewer yourself, they're often on autopilot. But when you can get them, when you force them out of autopilot and they actually have to think, Belafonte said, 
we would take off our shoes and socks and sit on the rug and listen to records. Oh. And I'd say, what? I said, what records? And he had to think about it again. He said, you know, I took Martin to a jazz club once, bebop, I think it was Lester Young we might have heard, and he didn't really care for it. <laughs> we listened to movement songs. We listened to like Peter, Paul, and Mary. We listened to Odetta. We listened to Lead Belly. Um, that's what he got, and he'd sing along. Oh. And I said, was, was Dr. King a good singer? And he just kind of chuckled and said, <laughs> he was a loud singer. <laughs> Well, here's a question from the audience. Since we're talking about Mrs. King, Coretta, she, the person writes, you have such adoration for Coretta Scott King. Why not write a biography about her? I guess I would and under one condition. Well, I want the family to say okay, but also Coretta's personal secretary told me that she kept a blue Samsonite suitcase under her bed with the most personal letters from Martin and... Nobody has seen that suitcase. So mm -hmm. if um, somebody has that suitcase, call me. I would, that would be enough to, I think, uh, s somebody soon should do a, a, a serious hmm. Red Scott King biography. Why was he a minister? This is another story that, that fascinates me. In, you know, because you, you have the, it, it seems like it was preordained, if I can use that term. I mean, his... His dad was a minister. His granddad was a minister. A I mean, well, father-in-law. His father's father-in-law was the senior pastor at Ebenezer. He and his father took over that church. You know, little nepotism there. But um, but 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 you seem to suggest that perhaps it wasn't. So tell, how how why did he become a minister? Well, he talked a long time about trying to break away out of the, from the family business. Mm -hmm. And he wanted, for a while, he thought about being a doctor or a lawyer while he was at Morehouse. But he kept getting pulled back. And this is a kid who, as you said, grows up in the church almost like a, a, a prince, you know. Um, and his friends and family recalled that he would practice preaching um, like weddings with the pets, you know. He would, he would do funeral services for, you know, dead animals that he found in the backyard. So it was definitely, you know, at, at the same time, he was challenged by his father. He was embarrassed by his father a little bit because his father was a country preacher and um, stomped around and shouted in church, and King found that embarrassing. He wanted to be a more intellectual preacher or maybe not a preacher at all. But you start to see that he's really being drawn to it. In, during high school, his year between high school and, and Morehouse, he's only 15, 16 years old, he goes to Simsbury, Connecticut to work as a, cotton, a tobacco farmer. And he volunteers to lead the prayers at, among the other farmers. So you know that, there's, that he's got an interest in it. And then um, it's funny because while he's in Connecticut, he and some of his friends get stopped by the police, probably just for driving being black in white part of Connecticut, but he calls his father to break the news that he's now been charged with some crime, and that's when he tells his father, I've decided to become a preacher. Uh, so he's doing it in part to, to hoping that it won't, he won't get punished for the incident with the police, and his best friend at the time said, you know, uh, ML wasn't called to the pulpit by God. He was chased there by the cops. He really was brilliant, though. I mean, you, you mentioned, I, I know people have read this in certain biographies and they don't really believe it, that he went to Morehouse when he was, what, 15? He really did when he was 15. And it wasn't because they, you know, worked their king magic to get him in. It wasn't a favor. It was that he had been skipped several times. Like, how was he gifted? Yeah, it's a great question because he didn't get good grades. He even got a C in, in sermon, <laughs> in sermons um, at... at at, at um, seminary, so he was not a great student, and sk skipping those grades actually took, an, took a toll. If you read his, ha his handwritten speeches, the spelling is atrocious, um, and his math was even worse. So not a great student. King and I have a couple things in common. We're both exactly 5'7", and we're both solid B students all the way through. Um, but he was brilliant, and, and you really see the brilliance because he absorbs this philosophy, he absorbs the theology, and he's able, I think his greatest genius is his ability to communicate those things in a way that speaks to broad audiences. And we discover this right away in Montgomery, actually the first day that he's called to speak in Montgomery. He was not looking to become a leader of the movement. He just, he had a new church and a new baby at home, and he had just said no to the NAACP when they asked him to join the Alabama board of the, of the NAACP. But he's asked to speak after Rosa Parks' arrest. 
and he agrees to just be the spokesman, to try to get people to stay off those buses on Monday. Mm -hmm. And that's the moment, really, when he finds, he discovers his gift, because he gives this speech spontaneously. He only had 10 minutes to prepare for it, and he had a panic attack, an anxiety attack for the first five minutes of his time he had to prepare. And he gets up there, and he gives this speech that really becomes the blueprint and the model for his success for the rest of his career, which is only 13 years. He's 26 years old on this date, December 5th, 1955. And he stands up in front of the Holt Street Baptist Church, thousands of people and thousands more spilling out into the streets with loudspeakers set up. And he says, it just may be that the black people of this country, the people who've been treated worst, are the ones who are going to teach us what democracy is really all about. And if we are wrong in demanding justice, then the Constitution is wrong, and the Bible is wrong, and the Supreme Court is wrong, and God Almighty is wrong. And it's an argument that you almost can't shoot down, right? And it resonates not just with those folks in the church, but beyond. The news media in the North mm -hmm. suddenly picks up on this. And now you've got this moral authority, this, this, the civil rights struggle, which is just a bus, uh, a bus integration issue at that moment. It's not a civil rights struggle. It's just a bus battle. It suddenly becomes about who we are as a nation. And King is the one who finds that message and makes it and delivers it in a way that almost everybody finds compelling and can't really dismiss. Do you, uh, you know, obviously people are gonna have different answers to this depending on their own belief systems. I mean, some of us believe that our steps are ordered, right? And so that is our explanation. And some of us believe that the universe is random and cruel and are just going to believe that perhaps a unique combination of cell structures combined in this person to bring him to this place in that time. Without putting you on the spot about your own personal beliefs, what do you believe is the source of his gift? I am putting you on the spot. Yeah, you are. What, what do you believe is the source of his gift? God, mm -hmm. the Bible, Jesus. Um, I think he felt like he truly believed that we are meant to live up to the words in the Bible. And that if you truly believe that, you have to sacrifice, you have to give everything for that. And over and over again, and he said early in the Montgomery bus boycott that he had a moment of doubt, like, am I risking my family's life? Am I risking my child's life? His home was bombed. Soon after that, he was stabbed in the chest. He said that God spoke to him and that he literally heard the voice of God say, go on, keep going. And that once he heard that voice, he couldn't turn back. And most of us would have turned back. Most of us would have said, okay, I've done my part. I've, done, I've, I've, I've got us this far. Certainly after the Voting Rights Act, after the Civil Rights Act, I mean, after the March on Washington, when the government is on his back, when more radical, younger black leaders are attacking him, he easily could have said, okay, someone else's turn. Mm -hmm. But he couldn't because he truly believed. You know what, you've recounted, I mean, some of you who are students of his story will remember some of these incidents, but yes, he was privileged for his time. I mean, he lived in a house that his family owned, he was surrounded by black excellence, but he was not, it was impossible to protect your children from the ugliness of the apartheid South. It was impossible. As I would argue, perhaps it remains impossible to completely protect your children. And there are some incidents where he was treated horribly. I mean, you, you, you know, we don't need to go into all the sort of ugly details, but being slapped in the face. But he, you know, he had a newspaper route, and when he went to collect one of the, from the, one of his white customers, the white customer refused to pay him. And when he insisted, he said, no, it's in my book. You know, man, you know, called him the the N word, slapped in the face by some woman for no reason, saying he stepped stepped on her foot on the bus, that kind of business. But he really, and 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 you also recount this is one of the parts I really found fascinating. His his forebears had some horrible, horrible experiences. His father, his grandfather, his mother, um, just awful experiences which were seared into them. And yet he really seems like a person who believed what he said, that he really did love everybody, or he tried to. That's hard. 
I don't know about y'all, but that's hard. I, I, I mean, you know, people can say some, cut you off in traffic, and you'll be mad for the rest of the day. You know, I mean, and we know about that in D.C., do we not? <laughs> and, you know, I'm just, what, what's your take on that? I mean, talk about that. Like, how he dealt with those private feelings of rage that we all have. I can't imagine, really, and I certainly can't imagine what it's like to grow up black in America and the American South, and at the time he did. But his father, you know, and I, one of the, we haven't talked about some of the archival discoveries I made, like Coretta Scott King's tapes that she made when she began working on her autobiography just months after the assassination. Um, but one of the really important ones that was an unpublished Daddy King autobiography that there were only two copies and the family didn't even know it existed. And Daddy King is such an interesting, important character, who does, another person who deserves another book. Um, but Daddy King is born into sharecropping, Martin Luther King Sr. His name, Mike King. We should point out that Martin Luther King Jr. Was, grew up Mike. And his father, after visiting Germany and learning more about Martin Luther, decided to change his name and came home and said, by the way, you know, Mike, you've got a new name too. But um, Daddy King, you know, at the age of 12, walks off the farm where his parents have been sharecropping, is, can't take it anymore, has seen the destruction to his father in particular. His father is a violent alcoholic who abuses, uh, physically abuses members of the family. And Daddy King just walks off the farm to Atlanta, age 12, virtually illiterate, and remakes himself in Atlanta and makes it possible for Martin Luther King and Christine King and A.D. King to have this very relatively protected childhood. And, and that makes all the difference, I think. It, and it certainly paves the way for King to start to think that he can be the guy who kills Jim Crow. Mm, mm. So I do want to get to the questions from, from uh, that you all have been sending us, but a couple things that I just have to ask you about. The FBI surveillance, uh, and we actually have a question from the audience about that too, which is, you know, say more about that. This, this questioner says, how do, you, how do you make sense of the FBI surveillance of civil rights leaders of the 60s and 70s? And this person goes on to ask, like, what's the resonance to the current moment if you, if you, if you see sort of yeah, resonance? And I also, if those of you who've read Beverly Gage's biography of J. Edgar Hoover will also realize how, okay, crazy this is that he's so worried about these folks and their behavior when... <laughs> just... FYI, worth a read. Mm -hmm. I have to say, first of all, the, the, the section of the book that was hardest for me to write mm -hmm. was the chapter that comes after the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. The March on Washington chapter was hard for me to write in a way just because how do you match the brilliance of his oratory on the printed page? So I did this, something I've never really done before. I wove in the stories of several people who were at the march along with King's speech. Uh, one of them was a, a young black girl, teenager from Chicago, um, Francine Yeager, who just at the last minute put two bottles of Pepsi in her, and a change of underwear in her backpack and came to, sh came to Washington. The other was Gunny Gundrum, the white park ranger who's standing next to King while he delivers the speech. And at the end of this chapter and at the end of the March on Washington, there's a sense of hope that America might really be turning the corner. And even the white mainstream media is saying, this country is ready to change. We are ready, it really looks like we might finally put our, the sin of slavery behind us, that we might become a nation of brothers and sisters. And I spoke to people who decided after that, watching the March on Washington on television, that they were gonna integrate their, their workplaces, that they were going to, one guy was going to um, put a picture of his African-American wife on his desk, he was white, he didn't want his workers, coworkers to know he was married, now he was gonna fess up about it. There's this great moment of hope. And what happens the day after the March on Washington? The day after, FBI Assistant Director William Sullivan writes a memo for the boss that says, given King's speech yesterday, given his demagogic oratory, we must now consider him the most dangerous man in America when it comes to race. And we must do everything possible to undermine his work. And they ramp up the surveillance. And soon after that, they send a package to his home with a tape of some of his highlights from his hotel rooms, sexual um, sounds, whether it's him on there or not, we don't know, um, and with a letter to King saying, this will be released to the press. The whole world will know about your demented, 
private life if you don't kill yourself. Our government produces that letter and sends it to him anonymously. And from that moment on, he's dogged for the rest of his life. And it's not just that they want to make his life difficult. They want to destroy him. They want to destroy the civil rights movement. And they were pretty effective. So when you think about it, and I say this in the book, it may be that J. Edgar Hoover was right. It may be that he was the one who recognized that King really was going to force this country to change its power structure and to put an end to white supremacy and to create a new balance of power in which black people had a shot at equal justice. And that was abhorrent to J. Edgar Hoover, and he was going to do everything possible to stop it. And he was very effective in that. So how is that relevant to today? Well, ask anybody who's uh, protesting the George Floyd or any of the other acts of violence perpetrated by law enforcement, mm -hmm. right? Going back, to, going back to Coretta Scott King, she was also fearless. I mean, th their house was bombed. He wasn't home. In fact, her father and her father-in-law, Daddy King, wanted to bring them back to Atlanta. We had a new baby. Why didn't she go? She was like, no, I'm not, I can't go because he's here. I mean, it reminds me of, you know, people make so much of like the queen mother of you know, who wouldn't leave London during the Blitz. It's very similar, and they didn't live in a palace. I mean, she was like, I can't go because he's here, and the kids are here, so I can't go. I'm here because they're here. I'm staying. She could have. They literally drove up after this bombing to go get her and say, get in the car. We're taking you back to Atlanta. She wouldn't go. Yeah. So, so what, what was the source of her courage? Maya Angelou called her a steel magnolia. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that was it, and that moment is critical because both of their parents, after the house was bombed, both of their parents, Daddy King and um, Mr. Scott Obi, drove to the house in Montgomery and said, let's go. And it was Coretta who spoke first. And you know, it's interesting, Martin Luther King Jr. had a very hard time confronting his father. He had a very hard time saying no. He would always just say, okay, we'll talk about it later. He couldn't stand up to his old man, but Coretta could. Coretta's the only one who could ever stand up to Daddy King. Mm -hmm. um, and she knew who she was. And there's this great essay she wrote for a magazine that I never heard of called New Lady. Mm -hmm. And Coretta wrote this herself. It's a long article, probably three, 4,000 words. And she felt so strongly about it, I think, that she actually signed, uh, sent a copy of it to Rosa Parks. Um, in Detroit and said, I thought you might like to read this. It's really like her manifesto. Mm -hmm. And she says, look, I know that I'm relegated to second tier status. I know that I'm expected to stay home and take care of the kids. I know that a lot of people think I'm just the woman who cooks and takes the kids to the doctor's appointment, but I know what I'm really doing. I know how much I am helping him as a intellectual partner, as, a, as an activist partner. It's not just that she's the support network. She is a driving force. She speaks out on the Vietnam War before he does. And there's this great moment that we have again because of the FBI where Mar um, Stan Levison and Bayard Rustin are discouraging King from speaking out on Vietnam. These people who at one time were more radical than King are now encouraging him to tone it down. And they're saying, don't go give that speech about Vietnam. And, and Martin's Again, because he doesn't like confrontation. He says, well, what if I sent Coretta to do it? <laughs> and Coretta goes and gives a speech, but then Coretta starts putting more pressure on Martin to start give, speaking up on his own, and, she, and he does. Mm. So, and, and don't forget when, when um, King finds out, when King wins the Nobel Peace Prize. First of all, I should point out that he was in the hospital being treated for depression when he got the news. He thought he was dreaming because he'd been taking sleeping pills. It was the only way he could get to sleep. But Coretta calls and gives him the news that they won the Nobel, that he won the Nobel Peace Prize, and she says, we mm -hmm. have a greater responsibility than ever now mm -hmm. to speak out on issues beyond civil rights, to speak out on poverty and militarism. We have to think about a more global role now. Mm. That's Coretta. One of the uh, members of the audience would like to know if there were any moments in King's life that resonate with you personally. I mentioned the bad grades. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's very hard. And one of the reasons I wrote this book is to try to help us relate to somebody who we've turned into a monument and a national holiday and who seems 
so distant. But for me, I guess being able to meet the people who knew King and calling some of them my friends now, like the feeling that I have a friend who was a friend of Martin Luther King's, um, that moves me deeply, but it also just reminds me that our heroes are human. And I may not, I know I will not ever have the courage that he had, but I also feel like it makes me think that we all have to do whatever we can, that, you know, to live up to those examples, because they are human. Well, that, that actually, and we talked about this, we were talking about this backstage before we came out. One of the things about the book that struck me and really made me feel some kind of way were the moments that call to mind current situations that we are addressing, um, both in, in our public life, in politics, and not just like today or yesterday or last week, but just, you know, here we are, you know, how many, many years later, and there are just a number of incidents, particularly regarding his relationships and um, negotiations with white authority figures. It was fascinating to me, like, how often JFK was annoyed with him. LB, Lyndon Johnson was annoyed with him um, because he wasn't doing what they wanted. And it just, there was just, it brought up a lot for me about the way um, just African Americans expressing their own agency are then expected to subsume their agency in the service of somebody else's. And when they don't, they're wrong, they're stupid, they don't understand, you know, that kind of thing. And I just was wondering for you, as you were working on this, were there moments like that where you thought, oh wow, this reminds me of? Well, there's so many moments. First of all, every time something good happens, every time King accomplishes something, there's a backlash. Um, and, you know, we see it, obviously I mentioned the FBI increasing its surveillance after the March on Washington. We see it in the bombing of the church in Birmingham after the March on Washington, and we still see that. You know, what's the backlash? What's the response to Obama being elected? We get Trump. Um, but over and over again, I think talking about King and his relationships with, with white authorities, um, I want to mention something here. King never understood why politicians wouldn't do the right thing morally. Mm. And it, it, little, it legitimately baffled him. Like, wait, Kennedy promised us civil rights legislation. We got him elected. Why isn't he doing it? He promised us. And I think that some of that is his idealism, his, his youth, perhaps. Remember, he's, we have our, Kennedy's the youngest president in history, right? King is 12, 13 years younger. So, but, I, but what fascinates me most is his, his idealism. And, and, and it would frustrate people like Bayard Rustin and Stan Levison. Why isn't he being more political? There's this great moment, and you know, we can listen to all of the conversations that King had with LBJ. Anybody, you can go home tonight if you don't want to watch the football game. And you can just go to the LBJ Presidential Library and you can listen to all the conversations. And there's this incredible conversation that says so much about who King is and about who LBJ is, right? Um, there's rioting, um, violence has erupted in Los Angeles after the murder of an innocent um, black motorist, mm -hmm. murdered by police. And King goes to Los Angeles and his advisors are saying, don't go. It's a, it's a disaster there. You don't know anything about Los Angeles. You have no connections there. The mayor's not gonna want you there. He goes. And even a lot of the younger black activists in town don't know what to make of Martin Luther King. What's he doing here? But King goes and he's, he's trying to broker some kind of a peace. And he gets on the phone with LBJ and he says, what we need here is the mayor and the police chief to understand that this is not a one-time incident. Mm -hmm. That black people here are afraid of this happening. Police brutality is a constant threat. And economic inequality is a problem. The job market, you know, we need to address the fundamental concerns that are causing Watts to blow up right now. Mm -hmm. And LBJ is incredibly responsive. He's respectful. He's listening. He says, I'm, I appreciate this. I'm going to work with you, whatever we can do together. And at that moment, Almost anybody else in Martin Luther King's shoes would have said, by the way, Mr. President, thank you. I'm happy to work with you on this. And it, while we're at it, how about getting J. Edgar Hoover off my back? Mm -hmm. And I think LBJ would have respected King for that because that's the way politicians work. Mm -hmm. But King never thinks about asking for anything for himself. And I think in, in many ways that hurts him. 
on the in the practical sense. And I think there's this just they don't know how to speak each other's language. Mm, interesting. One person wants to know what was King like as a father. He was a wonderful father who wasn't around as much as he or the children would have liked, and certainly not as much as Coretta would have liked. When he came home, he loved playing with the kids. He had, you know, rituals. He would put them up on the refrigerator, on top of the refrigerator, and let them jump off into his arms. And then each kid had a special place that he would kiss them um, when, they, when they jumped off of the uh, fridge. He would take them swimming. Um, but he was home maybe, you know, three or four days a month. Mm, yeah. Do you think you left anything, do you think you left anything out? Yeah, I left a lot out uh, on purpose because I wanted people to read the book mm -hmm. uh, and it's already pretty long. But my biggest regret is that I rushed some things in the end. The last year of his life is reduced to one chapter, and that's intentional. Mm -hmm. you know, I left out some amazing sermons, including his last sermon here in Washington at the National Cathedral. Um, I left it out, and I left out a lot of the conspiracy theories about how he died because I wanted the reader to cry mm. when they got to the end of this book. I wanted them to feel how much we lost. Mm. And I felt like if I didn't really control my pace in that last chapter, if I, if I felt like I had to cover everything, then I would, I would lose some of the emotional power of that, that last, those last days of his life. Well, this is kind of a direct request from our director, Mr. Young. So I'm going to ask about the uh, I Have a Dream speech, um, which we apparently can See, it's, it's not on display often because it's fragile, but this was the copy that was actually on the lectern. It was a wonderful story about how it was saved. But tell us about that. It's a, it's, is, it, is it a spoiler to say it's, well, he told us, right? It's not, those words aren't in the, they're not in the copy. Yeah, um, and it's really important to read the speech that we have here. And one of my big complaints is that we teach I Have a Dream speech to children, but we don't have them read the first part that he actually wrote in advance. Remember, this is the March on, jo March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. It was about economics. And King was beginning to really stress that we were never going to truly fix the problems of race in America without addressing economic inequality. And the speech really talks a lot about reparations, about police brutality, about the fact that America made a promise when it freed the slaves, and that promise has not been fulfilled it's a check that was returned with insufficient funds. Mm -hmm. And then he gets to the end of that speech, and he just decides, you know, he, uh, I think he was, it, he, was he was assigned 10 minutes. Um, the other speakers were given eight. But he gets to the end of his 10 minutes, and he just decides, I'm Martin Luther King. <laughs> it's time for church. <laughs> and, you know, there's one of the other things that I corrected in this book. Uh, there's a story that's been published over and over again that, correct, that um, Mahalia Jackson, thought the speech was a little flat and said, and she'd heard him give the dream speech in Detroit a few weeks earlier, and that Mahalia Jackson shouted out, tell him about the dream, Martin. Mm -hmm. And then he said, so today I have a dream, right? But that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. that, that has been um, published in many, many books, but I think I've, I've thoroughly debunked I've heard it. it. I think I've yeah. proven. Well, tell us what's true. I got true. a hold of the, mm -hmm. so Motown was hoping to make a record that day and they had the best microphones on the podium, and I got a hold of the master recording of the Motown recording of the I Have a Dream speech, and, and Mahalia Jackson is sitting right in front of King. You can hear every grunt. You can hear every sigh, every time she says anything. She does not say tell him about the dream until after he has started into the dream. Mm. So she's basically cheering him. She's encouraging him. She's not, amening him. She's amening him. She's saying, tell him about the, tell him about the dream, mm -hmm. Martin. That's not tell him about the dream, Martin. It's tell him about the dream. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's really important because it's King's agency. King deserves the credit, not Mahalia. Mahalia deserves lots of credit for many great things. And um, she was also Martin Luther King's favorite cook, <laughs> uh, footnote. But King gets to the end of that powerful speech about economics and decides that he wants to leave the crowd on a more upbeat note. And this is what he does best. This is where he's, I think he's most happy in life when he's preaching, when he's giving a sermon, when he puts the notes aside and he just 
takes you to church. And, and that's what he does in that. Story. All right, so this is our last question, and thank you all again for coming. Thank you so much for coming. Why don't you give us your final thought? Why don't you take us to church? No pressure at all. <laughs> no, thank you. I, uh, <laughs> but what do you want us to go out on? I, what, I, is the, what is the last thing you want to leave us with? And thank you for this beautiful work, and thank you for your fine reporting. As a journalist, I very much appreciate your attention to detail and your wonderful stories. But what's the last thing you'd like us to think about as we leave here tonight? Well, don't ask me to take you to church. I'm the wrong guy for that job. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a, a, an interesting story. I mentioned how hard I worked on the last pages of the book. Somebody said to me after the book came out, and this just goes to show how I'm still learning and I'm learning from my audience. Somebody said to me, wow, I was so moved by King's last words. The last words he spoke. And I was like, what were they? I don't know. And he said, well, they're in your book. And I had to go and look. And here's the thing. We all know that King is assassinated on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. And we all know that the night before, he gave this incredible speech in which he seemed to predict his own death. And he wasn't supposed to be in Memphis. He was preparing for the Poor People's Campaign, which was not going well at all. It was his most bold and ambitious move yet. Again, I talked about how he could have scaled back. He could have taken time off. He could have just stuck to voting rights, which is what his allies were telling him to do. But he said, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lead a poor people's campaign. It's gonna be Occupy Washington, D.C. We're gonna bring thousands of people to the mall in Washington, and we're not going to leave until the government agrees to fundamental reforms in economic uh, justice, guaranteed jobs, guaranteed income. And it's not going well at all. And then James Lawson asks him to come to Memphis. And again, his advisors say, don't go. It's a local issue. But King says, I have to go. These are exactly the poor people who I'm talking about trying to help. So King goes to Memphis, and on the last night of his life, he gives this speech where he says, it really doesn't matter what happens to me now. I'd like to live a long life. Anyone would. But that's not what's important. What's important is that we dedicate our lives to a cause, to fighting for justice, fighting for peace, fighting for what I've been saying and reading from the Bible all my life. And I have seen the promised land, and I may not get there with you, but I believe that together we will reach the promised land. And the next day, he's on the balcony at the Lorraine Motel, and it's getting kind of chilly, and his driver is getting ready to take him to dinner, and he says, Doc, why don't you go back inside and put on a jacket? And he says, okay, I will. And those are his last words. Mm. Okay, I will. And that struck this reader as really profound, and I put it in the book without even realizing how profound it was. And I think those are the words I'd like to leave us with, that King was human, he failed, he had flaws, but he never lost hope. He said that we had to stay awake to change and we had to keep fighting no matter how bleak it seemed. And if King could maintain that kind of hope and that kind of optimism, given what he went through, what we put him through, then I think all of us can keep going and all of us can do what little thing we can to make a difference and continue to say, okay, I will. Jonathan Ike, thank you so much. <laughs> Deirdre? Mm -hmm. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, and there's still more program to enjoy. Um, uh, Jonathan and I will be upstairs to personalize copies of the book, and they are still available for purchase. So we'll see you up in Heritage Hall. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for such a splendid conversation, and have a great night. <laughs>